Well, good morning and uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are this uh, fine day, this Thursday. Uh, this is Mark Turok from Exeter 1031 Exchange Services, along with my cohorts here today. We have John Bacigalupi from Cantor Fitzgerald Capital and Robert Zink from Whitehall Parker Securities. Today, we're going to be talking about the Delaware Statutory Trust and also the 1031 Exchange and what we like to call in our webinar series, the I'm a Seller Now, the diversification strategies uh, found through Delaware Statutory Trusts and how the 1031 Exchange uh, plays a role in all of that. So my role today is going to be going through the 1031 Exchange process, uh, what to expect, you know, what are you looking for, how do you choose a qualified intermediary, and John Bacigalupi is going to be going through the Delaware Statutory Trust and talk a little bit more about Cantor Fitzgerald's role and what the uh, properties that they're working on and uh, how you can uh, invest with them. And then uh, later after that, we'll talk to Robert Zink, who will go through some scenarios. He works with a lot of uh, investors who uh, have been involved with the Delaware Statutory Trust and has seen uh, different, uh, you know, scenarios and uh, different uh, strategies that people have used and uh, kind of walk through some of the examples that uh, most recent examples that he's been working on with some of his clients. So with that, I'd like to get started. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So I normally do this presentation as unraveling the mystery of the 1031 exchange. We do this uh, presentation as often as we can as education because there's a lot of information online, but a lot of it is missing or misleading. So, you know, we like to help the clients fill that gap. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Perfect. Here we go. Move this out of the way here. Oops. There we go. All right. So, Exeter 1031 Exchange Services. We are what's called a qualified intermediary. Uh, we work in all 50 states. That's a question I get quite a bit. Uh, we offer all of the exchange options. So the, more, the most uh, prevalent of them is the forward exchange. Uh, we also do reverses, improvement exchanges, and we're one of very few qualified intermediaries that will do foreign property 1031 exchanges. Uh, we've been doing this for 15 years as Exeter 1031 Exchange, and our CEO has administered for, I would say, 125,000 1031 exchanges during his career. So the company itself, with our senior team and everyone on board, we bring significant experience and decades with decades of experience. So it puts us in more of a consultative role, an advisory role. We're also available 24/7. So if you call, you know, after hours, uh, after normal business hours, you will pick. You know, we'll pick up the phone and you're going to get somebody uh, from myself to Bill Exeter to one of the other business development team members after hours. And uh, that does set us apart from the rest of the crowd. We also have our own trust company. That's Exeter Trust Company. That's, uh, so we're licensed, regulated, audited by the Wyoming Division of Banking. So our headquarters is in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, we offer fidelity bond coverage, errors and emissions coverage, fiduciary insurance coverage. And uh, 1031 exchange qualified trust accounts and escrow accounts, custody accounts, as well as the self-directed IRAs. So if you're interested in any of those aspects, especially the self-directed IRA, you can always reach out to me uh, at any time and, and I'd love to talk to you about that. So what is a 1031 exchange? It's actually part of the Internal Revenue Code, that's section 1.1031. And the textbook definition is the tax deferral strategy that allows an investor to sell rental, investment, or business use assets and then defer the payment of the income tax consequences by reinvesting those proceeds into qualifying use, like kind replacement property. So we'll kind of delve into that as we get going in here. So the benefits of the exchange, you know, there's going to be an income tax consequence on the sale of real personal property. So that taxable gain can be deferred or excluded with proper tax planning. And it really keeps investors' money working for them, uh, more money in your pocket. So again, it's a uh, wealth building tools, what we like to say. And then we also call it uh, the uh, swap until you drop. So you can keep swapping properties throughout your entire lifetime. And then when you pass on, you can uh, give that property over to your heirs and they get that step up in cost basis, the taxable gain goes away at death. So what are the different types of exchange structures? I talked briefly about them. So I'll kind of, you know, break them apart here. The first one, the forward exchange, that is the most uh, 
you know, dominant one out there uh, that our clients are involved with. I'd say 99% of our transactions are forwards. And that is your simultaneous versus delayed exchange. You're selling first, you're buying second. Uh, the reverse exchange, so that's where you're going to be buying the property first and selling second. It's a very powerful tool because you've got an opportunity to lock in the property that you want. So the, there's a parking arrangement that we handle for the client. And uh, it's there's a lot of moving parts to it, but it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's really one of those uh, exchanges that is, I think, the best option. If you have that option to do a reverse, you lock out, you know, you lock in what you really want to get and you eliminate any issues with timelines which we'll get into there's also the improvement exchange build a suit or construction exchange as it's uh, known and that is uh, you can sell your property and then you're going to invest those proceeds into improvements or on a replacement property so you can pick up land and then build on it or take over a building and you know, use those funds to repair that building so what is the role of a qi you may say, what is even a QI? What's a qualified intermediary? You hear the term accommodator. They like to say qualified intermediary these days. So uh, we prepare the legal agreements, related transaction documents, uh, receive, hold, and safeguard the 1031 exchange funds. And then we serve in that like advisory consultative role to guide the clients uh, through their exchange process. So at any given time, client calls us uh, more than happy to set up a conference call with their tax attorney, their CPA, uh, financial planner, walk them through the steps, make sure everybody's on board and comfortable with the exchange process that we're putting together for the client. So we safeguard the client's funds like I spoke about. So there's government oversight is totally critical in this role. Uh, qualified intermediary needs to be licensed, regulated and audited. And that's, you know, we have that through the state of Wyoming, the division of banking and make sure that they have significant bonding and insurance coverage and that they offer qualified trust accounts as we do. So. Uh, qualifying use property investors intent is critical in the 1031 exchange property must be held as investment purposes such as rental investment business use so you know we get these questions all the time like you know how to what is qualifying it's really the intention so it's like it's real estate for real estate at the end of the day but it's rental investment business use so your intention that you have been renting out this property you've got contracts in place clear intention to the irs that yes this is being held as a rental property uh, properties held for sale uh, or personal use will not qualify. I, I would say every week I get qu uh, calls from uh, flippers and you know asking about the process, and I explain to them, no, it's you know you're holding it for sale versus holding it for you know the long term or for investment or rental purposes. Again, condo conversions, flips, so those do not qualify. This is interesting. One. Interesting that the holding period is something that is um, no specific guidance really. Uh, we like to say 24 months, two years is really the solid way to, to go because you're straddling three tax returns. And by doing that, that shows clear intent to the IRS that this property is held for rental investment business use. Other advisors might say, you know, at least 12 months, 18 months, but we like 24 months. Um, the length of time really, like I said here, doesn't determine whether or not the property meets that qualifying use requirement. Again, like kind property, real estate 1031 exchanges, any kind of real estate does qualify. Again, you got to meet that qualifying use. And then there's foreign property 1031 exchanges. We get a couple of questions about that. So that would work for somebody that has a property overseas. So let's say they're in Germany and they wanted to exchange property again in Germany, that'd be fine, or Germany to France or France back to Germany. So foreign to foreign works, but not foreign to US or US to foreign. Again, these are all the different uh, categories uh, for like kind. So you've got single multi-family uh, residential, commercial office, retail shopping centers, vacant, undeveloped land, farmland. Uh, you got oil, gas, mineral rights, and then fractional ownerships. You got the Delaware Statutory Trusts, as John is going to talk to you about, especially during this uh, time right now. We're coming out of COVID, and you know everyone's getting their vaccines, and things are starting to you know percolate and hum along here. Uh, there's just a you know, fever pitch of, of sales going on right now. And what's the best way for you to, to defer those capital gains taxes? So John's going to talk to you later about the Delaware Statutory Trust, which to me, I every time I talk to a client new, I always talk to them about the DST, even if it's not the first, you know, uh, choice, like they're, they want to you know, control their own 
uh, real estate, I tell them like, you really need to have this as a backup strategy right now. Uh, Non-like non kind, certain types of properties are not considered to be like kind or qualifying use. That is your primary residence, second homes, vacation, anything with excessive personal use. And again, uh, ownership interest in an entity generally do not qualify for exchange treatment. So that's partnership interests, uh, membership interest in an LLC, shares of stock owned by in a corporation. But there are exceptions, uh, including disregarded entities like single member LLCs, a land trust, and uh, Delaware statutory trusts. So we talked about uh, you know identification um, when you go ahead and sign up to do an exchange there are rules around that so when you get the you know escrow closing recording happens escrow wires us the funds to hold on your behalf that starts your 45 days identification period and that's really the most you know i would say the the hardest part of the whole exchange process is that period because it's a very tight window and you've got a lot of things to to do but it begins at the close um i people ask me how can i you know, extend this this period. I said, well, you can delay the closing, uh, look at properties early, and then, as I mentioned just a minute ago, consider the Delaware Statutory Trust. It's a really fantastic way to, you know, work in this environment that we have today, and it's just a really good investment vehicle. Deadlines, again, this uh, 45 days plus an additional 135 for a total of 180 days. So I get this question a lot is, it's 180 days to close, but that first 45, you're spent identifying. So when you get up to day 45, up to midnight, whatever day that is, could be a Saturday or Sunday, you've got an identification form from us, you're putting in probably the three property rule, there's other rules out there, but uh, you know you wanna fill that in, send it into us, and then that allows you to work on those three properties that uh, over the next you know uh, six months to close on. So it's not 45 days plus 180 days, but it's 180 in total. COVID impact, we did have uh, an extension this, gosh, back in April. Uh, there are no more extensions. It ended in July. Um, everything's back to normal at this point as far as timelines go. So the identification requirements, it's got to comply with one of the uh, these three rules. Most people will do the three property rules. So we submit uh, to you the identification form. You fill it out with literally three properties you're considering and you have to close on at least one of those properties that you've given to us. So you can change up that uh, makeup of those properties uh, during the first 45 days as many times as you need to. And then once day 45 hits, that's locked in place. So you have to work with just those properties. Uh, there's also the 200% fair market value rule. So in a simple way to look at it would be if you have a million dollar property you sold, you can you know, identify more than three properties, four, five, six, just as long as cumulatively they add up to be no more than $2 million in this example. Uh, the 95% exception rule that is more for the portfolio managers out there with a large inventory. So <clears throat> they would be closing like 15, 16, 20 properties, more, whatever, but they have to close on 95% of the value of that portfolio. Again, the identification needs to be specific, unambiguous, you know, using the address or the legal description of the assessor's parcel number. And it needs to be delivered to the QI, to, back to us. I mean, I get calls on this even on the weekends, like today's my 45th day, uh, it's a Saturday. And yeah, you gotta send it back in, you know, timestamp that thing and you'll be good to go. So it doesn't, if on the weekends that happens, yes. So, you know, you gotta be focused on the day that you're 40, there, what day, of the week that falls on. So if it's a weekend, you still need to comply with that. It's calendar days. All right, so we've got reinvestment requirements. In order to defer all of your income tax, you have to have the intent, right, to reinvest in like kind replacement property, trade equal or up in fair market value based on the net sale price, and then reinvest 100% uh, of the equity net cash proceeds into the replacement property. So you can always add cash into the exchange, but anytime you withdraw cash, you're gonna be paying a tax on that. So, you know, there's partial exchanges, uh, 1031 exchanges, they are permissible because I do get that question. Um, it's not an all or nothing situation. Uh, some people do go down in value and if they do, they just tax on that difference. So again, here's the partial 1031 exchange. It's uh, permissible, they do not harm the overall exchange at all. Pulling cash out of your exchange transaction, you can do that. Just be taxed on that or trading down in value or obtaining a larger loan 
or other debt on the property, which results in cash left, left over. So that's kind of a quick whirlwind tour of the 1031 exchange process. Uh, I've got my information up on the screen here. If you ever need to talk to me about or have questions generally, um, you know, feel free to reach out. The best number there is my desk line at 619-764-6332. And then my email is up there on the screen if you can see it there. It's uh, mturok, T-U-R-O-K, at exeterco.com. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and move over to John Bacigalupi to give us the presentation he has with Cantor Fitzgerald. And I'll go ahead and do that right here. Well, While Mark is... Um, switching over the uh, display model to me, um, just to make sure you know, Mark is an exceptional resource. His firm, Exeter uh, Financial, has been doing this for a long period of time. Um, they're really experts at what they do. Um, and anytime you're working with a qualified intermediary, it's important to understand uh, their track record. You know, just as when you make a deposit at a bank, you want to make sure that that bank has been around for a long period of time. And Mark in Exeter has been around um, a very long period of time. So, Mark, can you confirm that you see the Delaware Statutory Trust uh, slide on my screen? I sure do. Yep. Excellent. So, you know, my role here is just to give investors more options and what we're seeing in the 1031 space right now is really the same as the real estate market. So anytime we're talking about the Delaware Statutory Trust or DST business, it's gonna emulate the real estate business. And what I mean by that is last year was a challenging year. There wasn't a lot of transaction volume in Q1 and Q2. And with the type of pandemic we went through, now we have a lot of people who see the value that working with a Cantor Fitzgerald um, and a Delaware Statutory Trust, having that passive ownership, not dealing with kind of tenants and toilets and trash, the terrible T's, uh, that can add a lot of value. Um, you know, what we've seen is that historically, we had a lot of investors ages 60 and above, you know, got a little older, it got to the point where they didn't want to pay taxes, first and foremost, so they still wanted to use Section 1031, but they didn't want to be involved in the day-to-day -day management. We are now seeing a lot of younger people who are investing in real estate. Uh, for instance, myself, I'm, I'm 41 years old. I have two beautiful boys that are six and eight years old. I don't have time. I wish I had more time to manage pr properties because I enjoy it. but the passive nature as life has got a little bit more complicated and i think when you get a little older you prioritize your time more than anything these are becoming more and more popular just a little bit of backdrop Cantor fitzgerald is the only investment grade rated company in the delaware statutory trust canner's been around since 1945 they're the largest private partnership on wall street so a very very stable sponsor I think that's very important for investors. Before you're looking at a specific asset, you got to make sure that that sponsor checks the box. What a lot of people aren't aware of is that Cantor Fitzgerald owns Newmark. Newmark is the third or fourth largest full service real estate company in the US up there with CBRE and Cushman Wakefield. So we have about 6,000 real estate professionals throughout the country. And we also are very data driven. You know, the way we make decisions on where to invest um, in this area is through data. We want growing markets like Dallas, Texas, like Nashville, Tennessee, like Fort Collins, Colorado, where we're looking at that local economy and it's continuing to perform. So let's jump into a little bit of background on the Delaware Statutory Trust. Uh, IRS Revenue Ruling 2004-86 is why investors are able to fulfill their 1031 obligations via a Delaware Statutory Trust. Uh, and all a Delaware Statutory Trust is, if you kind of break it down, it's a trust 
It's set up in Delaware. And a sponsor like Cantor Fitzgerald will buy that Amazon distribution center, that 300 unit apartment building. We will put it into a Delaware statutory trust. Once that's happened, we investors are able to fulfill their 1031 obligations as Mark so eloquently um, explained uh, and replace debt and equity by going into the Delaware statutory trust as a passive vehicle. So it fulfills those 1031 obligations, um, but it's doing it in a passive way. So revenue ruling 2004-86 is the IRS notice, um, and they're not that creative. The Delaware Statutory Trust was started in 2004. So approaching a 20 year anniversary and um, the trends is that this business is growing and we believe there'll be about five and a half billion dollars with a B of equity placed in the Delaware statutory trust market this year. So again, with the pandemic, with a lot of pent up demand, um, there is a lot of interest in this. Next, I kind of want to go into the advantages and also the disadvantages. So the advantages are very simple. You get to be a fractional owner of an institutional quality asset uh, with institutional management. So you could have a duplex in Eugene, a triplex in Portland or San Diego, and you can trade basically via 1031 into an Amazon or a 300 unit apartment building. So we think that's important. You're able to diver diversify. You can take that equity from that duplex and go into two or three different Delaware statutory trusts, providing diversification by not only geography, but also sector, maybe some triple net assets, multifamily, medical office. Next, non-recourse debt. You're not personally responsible for the debt and you get a new depreciation schedule. So your CPA or tax professional is going to like that because it makes the distributions that much more tax efficient. You get simple reporting at the end of the year with a grantor letter available in the first to second week of March. And just like with your other 1099s, you're going to make a little stack and you're going to send that off to your CPA. We offer low investment minimums at $100,000. And this really helps with uh, estate planning because your heirs are gonna get that stepped up basis uh, after liquidity in the program upon death. It's a little bit morbid, but in the 1031 exchange world, we use the term swap until you drop, and then the heirs get the stepped up basis. So more and more people are using the Delaware Statutory Trust as an estate planning tool. And then finally, closing with confidence. This real estate world is, is crazy right now. I don't think there's another appropriate word. Financing is at all time lows or close to it. And there's a lot of interest in properties. So I know in the San Francisco Bay Area where I reside, not uncommon to see five to seven different offering uh, offers on property and, and bidding wars. And so at a certain point, um, people are using the Delaware Statutory Trust as an option, as an insurance option. Although it's not an insurance product, as Mark mentioned, most people use the three property rule, where you can find two properties on your own, but maybe use this as a backup, because this may be the one say, saver for you uh, to avoid paying a lot of taxes. Finally, I really try to be fair and balanced as far as the pros, which we've outlined. Let, let's talk about some of the cons. DSTs are illiquid and there's no secondary market. So if you're interested in doing this, you're going to make a five to seven, six to eight year commitment where you're getting that cash flow. And once we decide as the sponsor to sell the asset, that money goes right back to Mark at the qualified intermediary. We would hope that you would look at another Delaware statutory trust offering, but you don't need to. You then have the ability to identify three other properties, a condo in Tahoe, 
uh, a home in Hawaii, and maybe another DST. So I think that's important. And the decisions are made in a fiduciary manner by Cantor Fitzgerald. Uh, the way Cantor Fitzgerald is compensated is through a acquisition fee. So we do the work to understand where to invest, why to invest. We buy the property on our own balance sheet, um, and then we sell those interests. So I think that's important to kind of understand. I think the conclusion to kind of wrap this up is, is very simple. Um, this is a sector that makes sense. It's growing tremendously. And as the baby, baby boomers age and as more people get into real estate, fulfilling 1031 obligations in a passive manner, I think is only going to significantly increase. There's going to be much more demand in the growing future, especially with, with the pandemic that we went through. You know, right now there's a moratorium on evictions through June. I think there's going to be a little bit more pain in the real estate world when potential evictions come as we work our way through this pandemic. And why not have a large institution managing a 400 unit apartment building for you as opposed to you dealing with two tenants at that duplex? So with that, I'm gonna uh, take the screen away and uh, stop the share. Thank you, John. And we can go back. Thanks, Mark. Perfect. Yeah, appreciate that. And uh, next, we'd like to talk to, uh, talk with Bob uh, Robert Zink from Whitehall Park. Or Bob, are you there? Just uh, like to uh, check in with you about the DSTs, the clients you've been working with, and just kind of give us a little overall, uh, you know, your perceptions of uh, the investors today, where they're at, and just some examples that you could share with the uh, the audience. Looks like you might be muted there. Oh. Hang on there. Right. Let's see. Says I'm unmuted. There we go. We can hear you now. All right. Thank you. Uh, John mentioned this, but I think it's uh, very important that you use an intermediary like Exeter that's done lots of deals, that has uh, security that you'll know the money's there but something john didn't mention but they've also done enough deals they've kind of solved every imaginable problem issues come up we have llc's we have wanting to go into three or four different properties backups there's just different situations and the clock is running on that 45 days it just runs out all too quickly so use somebody like exeter for your intermediary and then the sponsor, uh, Cantor Fitzgerald, that's been there, they don't have to do a deal to keep the lights on at their office. There's lots of uh, different profit centers at Cantor Fitzgerald, and they've been doing this for a long time. So they're going to source the best assets in the stronger markets, and you can sleep at night knowing that that asset is in a good market and managed by a best-in-class uh, management company. So who's doing DSTs today? What I'm seeing more and more is there are people my age and they're 65 and north that are tired of, as John mentioned, the terrible tees, tenants, toilets, trash, turnover, but they want to free up their time. They want to travel. They want to spend time with the grandkids, golf, whatever it is that you enjoy doing. You know, the freedom of knowing that you're not going to get any calls on a management issue. Something John didn't mention, I don't believe, but DSTs are forbidden from making capital calls. So you won't be on a trip somewhere, have your management company call and say, oh, by the way, tenant moved out, the unit is trashed, and the air conditioner went out. So we need eight grand to get this fixed. There won't be any capital calls. So you've got certainty that the investment's taken care of, and now you can exchange, as John has mentioned, into different asset classes in different markets. I recently exchanged a lady it's probably 65% of her net worth into a property, an Amazon property in Indianapolis, an apartment house in Huntsville, Alabama, and self-storage in the Southeast. She's 70. She was nervous about all of this moving from equity in a large apartment house she'd owned forever. And she said, Bob, what happens 
if all three of these properties go upside down. And I said, Nancy, if Amazon in Indianapolis, an apartment house in Huntsville where they're moving the air and space facility and self-storage in the Southeast all go upside down, then the country went upside down. And uh, we kind of are all turned back to farmers and uh, raising our own wheat and cows. And she chuckled and agreed that that's probably the case. So it can free up your time, can free up management, but also worrying about what's happening. As we get older, our concern is not so much estate building, is freeing up our time and knowing that we're going to get a check every month. When Tanner Fitzgerald sends a check or direct deposit to your bank, fifth to the tenth of the month, every month comes in, and you don't have to worry about what's going to happen at my duplex, triplex, fourplex. Uh, will I get a check or will there be a capital call? So it's certainty of the management and diversification. Sometimes it's diversification into multiple DSTs is a, an estate planning issue. Recently, I had a gentleman that had three children and he wanted to spread the money across three DSTs. So upon his demise, each of them would have their own DST and have the flexibility to when it sold, they could take the money in the step up and basis or exchange into another property and continue that way. So it's a great estate planning tool. Uh, I want to focus on it a little bit. John mentioned it, but today we have lots of deals falling apart because of lender issues. Lenders say, well, yeah, we'll make the loan, but you got to have this kind of cash reserves or environmental issues. Environmental issues have become more and more significant as there's been problems and then it comes back and well, the phase one really wasn't adequate. In this case, the property is closed upon, you know that you'll close. So it's a great backup property if for some reason your primary property doesn't uh, follow through for some reason. So it's the backup. Uh, also, we see people that have a couple million dollars are exchanging and there's $300,000 left over. Well, maybe you don't have anything you can buy for $300,000 that you like don't have time to find it. Uh, you know, I can find you a property with Cantor or one of the other sponsors if you don't like uh, what they have this month or if it's full, um, can put you into something in a matter of days and get it ID'd with Exeter. So there's always a way to handle boot, to handle a backup or as your primary uh, designation for uh, getting into safety and knowing that you can sleep at night, not worrying about management, cash calls, or tenants surprising us in the middle of the day. Or I live in Portland, Oregon, and my world, we, we can't uh, do much to impact our tenants. They don't have to pay the rent. We can't evict them. So those kinds of hassles um, are no longer a part of people's lives when they move out of Oregon. So moving to another part of the world, but never having to go see that property is a big benefit to the DST. So Mark, have you mentioned it for people to send in questions? Yes, uh, actually, thank you for that reminder. And we do have a uh, question and chat uh, section on the uh, uh, presentation there today. So our uh, people here that are attending live can actually put in a couple of questions. We do have a few that I've taken out here. Uh, first one I see here uh, from Jay says, if you identify three properties and then day 50, a new property pops up that you like much more, can you purchase uh, that item? So that goes back to uh, my presentation. So when you get past day 45, whatever is on our identification form, uh, that's it. So if you've got a new property that's happened on day 50, that cannot be considered for uh, the exchange. So you have to work within that confines of the 45 days, and which is critically important. We talked about uh, putting a DST as that backup strategy even for people that may not you know, be looking at a, a DST because you can go from what, like no knowledge to you know, closing in what, eight days, something like that, less than a week. <laughs> so it's pretty quick. Um, Exactly. And that, the other question that I get uh, all the time this popped up was, again was uh, best time to reach out to a qualified intermediary. Right now, because of the situation, everybody's in at a hurried pace. Uh, you know, I'm in Southern California and the market's just, it's 
really uh, on fire. So I tell people right when you get that offer, give me a call. You know, I used to say like, yeah, I have two weeks before the closing, that's fine too. That's all still fine, but things move really, really fast. So I say, as soon as you get that offer, we know who the escrow team is. Uh, get me involved right away, uh, just in case they want to start closing early. And um, that brings up another point. It's funny. They it talked about this. I had a client in Arkansas uh, called me up, and he was explaining to me just how their market down there in Fayetteville was. It, you know, it sounded just like Los Angeles or San Diego. It's like, it just, it's everywhere. So again, it goes back to just get involved early, uh, get, you know, get us on the phone as soon as you have that solid offer. Uh, the question that you have here uh, that came up, and I know, John, you addressed this, but it was, what are some of the risks involved with the DST or what, you know, what's the top risk that you perceive as, you know, with the DST? Yeah. Um, we always try to match up what what clients are trying to achieve. And so my fear, and I dealt with this with my father, who's in his mid seventies now, he was used to owning local real estate and doing a little sweat e equity, right? He was a son of a butcher. And if he could do it himself, instead of hiring someone, he would want to do that. So I think control, uh, we're very confident in the type of assets that we buy. You know, we're buying assets from 100 to $200 million where we're doing a full credit analysis of the tenant. We're doing a ton of research, quite frankly, more than I think regular individuals would do on their own with reports and all of the data and research that we have. So, you know, my concern is just make matching up the needs of a client. And a lot of that is if they're okay being passive. We speak and, and Bob and I have been on multiple calls with investors where after speaking to them, the Delaware statutory trust just didn't make sense because, you know, although we don't suggest people sell in two years of any kind of piece of real estate, if you own a piece of real estate outright, you could trade it. And so you're giving up the ability, you're gonna be a passive owner. So my concerns are not about the real estate because we're, we're pretty good at what we do. And we, tr we talk to you about what you're buying. It's not a blind pool. You know you're getting this asset in Texas and you're understanding why we bought it. I want to make sure investors understand that we want you golfing. We want you spending time with grandkids and we're taking this off your plate. Some people think they want it off their plate, but in reality, they don't. So I think that is something um, that is very important. Got it. Yeah, very good. Uh, another question here, John, uh, or Bob, too. Uh, is there a minimum value that uh, Cantor will handle? Yeah, we keep the minimums very low. The minimum is $100,000. Um, so uh, obviously that's a lot of money, don't get me wrong. Our average trade is usually about $550,000, uh, but we like the ability that you can diversify and go into multiple programs. And then last was, uh, what's the best way to find your DST listings? Yeah, you're going to give Bob a call and he's going to walk you through what we're seeing right now. And I, I tried to convey this is there's so much demand that we used to launch an offering and it would be available for 60 days. We launched an offering in Fort Collins, Colorado last week, and mm -hmm. we've already had commitments well in excess of the 63 million dollars of equity that we're raising and so i don't want to especially on a recorded call talk about specific offerings because the 1031 i hope one takeaway here is that you realize it's a timeline situation and you need to be able to identify and to be in cash so i think it's best to talk to to bob uh not only about Cantor's inventory but where other inventory is in the Delaware statutory trust market. And I'm sure Bob has some thoughts on that. Yeah, go for it, Bob. Yeah, back back to that question. I think it's important to, um, well, we can find you a property quickly. Maybe you need more time. So call me or someone like me early and look at some examples to get comfortable with the structure, with the documents, maybe get some of the paperwork filled out so that then when something like Fort Collins shows up, you're comfortable moving quickly if that's the property you want. So there's options. If for some reason Cantor doesn't have a good option, 
there are other good sponsors out there. But you want to want to have as much time as possible, and so that you don't feel rushed into it because you are changing from being actively involved to not being actively involved. Curiously, I've not had a client that once they made that change said, well, I wish I was actively involved. Mm -hmm. Somehow 65, 70, 75, uh, you know, John's dad will get to the point that, boy, I'm sure happy I don't do that anymore. There's, there gets to be that day, but I've never had a call where somebody said, I miss the involvement. Uh, on that recently, I moved an elderly gentleman into an apartment house of Cantor's in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Gentleman had built the apartment house he was selling, had owned it 25 years. And he called me up and he said, uh, Bob, should we go to Nashville and look at this property? And I said, Joe, there isn't anything that you don't know with looking about an apartment house, but what are we gonna see that Newmark Frank didn't see, the appraiser didn't see, the lender didn't see, the environmental company didn't see, and the due diligence people at Cantor. But if you want to go to Nashville, visit Dollywood, Elvis's house, or drink some bourbon and spend some time on Bourbon Street, then we should go do that. And his answer was, I don't want to see Dollywood. So <laughs> you really want to go see it, right off a trip and go see it. But it's something you don't have to do. So it the time gets freed up and once people make that decision, but it's a big change to John's point. We've been active and uh, now it's a time where you just want cash in and not have to be involved. And, and most people find that to be one of the most welcome changes of their life. Fantastic, thanks Bob. I got another question here. Uh, what type of markup does Cantor look for when they buy a property and sell it to the DST members? Uh, markup. So when we buy a piece of real estate, let's just say a piece of real estate costs $100 million. Uh, we charge an acquisition fee like all Delaware statutory trusts. And then we there's closing fees put on top of it. Usually it's about five, four and a half to five percent. So if a property costs $100 million, we're offering that program at 104, 105, give or take. Um, and so a lot of that is just regular closing costs. Those are built into the program. You know, if you're doing a piece of real estate on your own, you're, it's the same cost that closing costs that are involved in doing it on your own. Um, we just include those in the purchase price. So again, hundred million dollar piece of real estate, we're offering the program at maybe 104, 105 million. And so all of the reports that we do, closing costs, et cetera, that are associated with real estate are built in. We don't hand you another bill on top of it. Got it. Uh, last question looks like, uh, when the owner of the DST passes, does that create a liquidity window or do you have to wait until the DST sells uh, the property and closes? Exactly. It's the latter, Mark. Um, so if there was a, a death, um, we have the ability, um, we had an advisor uh, who had a client pass away. Uh, there was a million dollars in a Delaware statutory trust. There were two heirs. Each of the heirs got $500,000 interest with, through one form. We can change ownership. And then um, although the client did pass away, those heirs step into their shoes. And in that program, uh, it ended up lasting another 18 months. So mm -hmm. um, the heirs stepped in, they received the distribution. Um, also with estate planning, what I have found is that there's always uh, some horse trading, as I like to say, at the end, where someone wants the vintage Ferrari and someone wants the Delaware statutory trust. Someone wants the grandma's China someone wants the home. So a lot of times uh, there's a lot of flexibility, I think is my point, where some people are looking to get uh, the Delaware statutory trust interest and others are interested elsewhere. And I'm sure Bob has dealt with this before and, and has some comments. Yeah, I think he's got some thoughts there. Go, go for it, Bob. What, what John has said is absolutely correct, but it is real estate. If you owned a 
duplex, fourplex, strip center, you still have to find a buyer. So while there's not a liquid market like the stock market, it's something you can sell. I've been selling tenant and common properties and DST properties for about 15 years now and have only run into two liquidity issues that were serious. One was a contentious divorce and the other one was an uninsured illness of a child that was going to take a lot of money and owning an equity like a Cantor Fitzgerald property I was able to go out to other investors and say, I have a client who's been in this property four years. It's probably another two to three years. It's not a property issue. It's a client issue. Who would like a position in a DST that said of being five to seven is two to three, three to four years. And have been able to sell those uh, interests in both those situations at par and get people the liquidity. So while that's not a guarantee, there's, there's people out there say, you know, I need a DST and I'd like it shorter. So like any other real estate, it's saleable or exchangeable. I mean, I'm at a marketing meeting in Las Vegas. There was someone here with a client that he had a DST interest and he exchanged that into something. They wanted to participate in something else. So part of their down payment was cash and the balance was a DST interest. But as far as the liquidity issue, it's doable, but it's not out there on the market waiting for you to just get it it's like a stock market in seven days <coughs> excuse me well i think that wraps up some of the questions we've had today so with that uh, gentlemen I'd like to you know thank you for your time and thank you again for our audience that's uh, watching this and uh in the future as we send this out uh just want to give you my contact information as we conclude today and be on the lookout we do these monthly the what we've decided the last Thursday of the month, 11 a.m. Pacific time. So be on the lookout for more invitations for that, everyone. My, the best way to reach me is uh, my desk line. It rolls to my cell phone. That is 619-764-6332. Uh, I've got my email address. It's M for Mark, first initial, last name, Turok, T-U-R-O-K, at Exeter Co, E-X-E-T-E-R, uh, Co, C-O, dot com. Uh, go ahead, uh, Bob share your contact information with the uh, audience here? Yeah, my uh, direct line is 503-880-6968. That phone's always with me. And my email is robert at zinc, Z-I-N-K, realtyadvisors.com. Feel free to call or email anytime. And John, you want everything to roll through to uh, to Bob? So but yeah, go ahead you know, and say Bob thank you to the... We work on a lot of cases, so please contact Bob and Mark uh, regarding your exchange. And again, I always want to end with, you got to set up the account at the qualified intermediary sooner rather than later. We all don't want that photo finish. And uh, when you're doing an exchange, you want to work with first-rate quality people and firms. And I can attest to just working with Mark and Bob um, over a number of years uh, that they're going to do what's in your best interest. And, uh, you know, we think the 1031 is one of the most as powerful estate planning tools out there. And the Delaware Statutory Trust, you know, uh, is really a, a need filler. So appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and I'll turn it back over. Thank you very much, John and, and Bob. I really appreciate your time as always and uh, look forward to working with you guys again next month. And uh, we'll kind of go from there. But everybody, thank you very much for joining us today. We'll be sending this uh, uh, recording out to all of you. So if you can share it with your friends, uh, you know, feel free to pass it around. We look forward to those questions and helping you guys out with your future transactions. Thank you all very much and look forward to next month. Thanks, gentlemen. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.